everyone, this is Jason Kendall. Welcome to the next of my introductory astronomy lectures. Today, we're going to talk about exploding stars, the biggest stars in the universe, how they live, how they're born, and how they die. Again, let's review how a low-mass star like the Sun evolves from a protostar. The Sun will have a long main-sequence lifespan of about 10 or 11 billion years. It will eventually spill over into a red giant and pump off its outer layers, forming a planetary nebula. This will reveal the core as a white dwarf. The images across the bottom catch this sequence in examples around the sky, starting with the star-forming region, named the Horsehead Nebula. Then, in the middle picture, we see images of both a globular cluster in the lower right and a beautiful open cluster in the upper left. Both are birthplaces of stars. Open clusters spread apart, and globular clusters remain tight forever. Finally, on the right is the Ring Nebula, which is a planetary nebula surrounding a tiny, tiny white dwarf. This stellar end state is the final destination for a star like the Sun. Well now, what about more massive stars? We're going to look at stars more massive than the Sun, at least six or eight solar masses. This encompasses the hottest stars, which are the O and B type main sequence stars. Their extreme surface temperatures mean that their cores burn much hotter than our Sun. Consequently, they live extremely short lives compared to the Sun. In our main sequence phase, which you could see in the red box, they too burn hydrogen into helium in the core and build up an inert helium core, just like low mass stars. The hydrogen burning occurs through a different process. It's not the low temperature proton-proton chain, but through the carbon-nitrogen-oxygen cycle, or CNO cycle. This process requires much higher temperatures for these heavier elements to act as a catalyst. No matter the path, the main sequence is defined as the collection of stars whose main energy generation process is the fusion of hydrogen into helium. But the main sequence for massive stars lasts, at most, only about 10 million years before that helium core starts to burn and the star evolves off the main sequence. Here we see a sketch of an outline of our goals in this lecture. We want to know about the stars in the top three lines of this diagram. The most massive stars are across the top, with the boundary stars in the massive group just above the Sun-like stars. Note that these massive stars all start as blue supergiant main sequence stars. They're all fated to end in some kind of supernova, leaving behind some kind of hyper-compact stellar remnant like a neutron star or a black hole. In this video lecture, we'll look at the run-up to the supernova process after the stars depart from the main sequence. So let's look at one of the quintessential high-mass post-main sequence stars in the sky. You know it by sight, it's that red star above the belt of Orion, Betelgeuse. No, not the film starring Michael Keaton. It's a much older name arising from Arabic, meaning armpit of the giant. That's a great name. In this image, it's at the center of the trees, Another red giant star, Aldebaran, is off to the right. It's the brightest star in the horns of Taurus. Betelgeuse is a nearby supergiant red star in the constellation of Orion, and it's had a lot of news about it recently, so let's learn a little more about it. First, let's learn about its size. Here we see the inner terrestrial planets of our solar system in relative size. Mercury is a tiny spot, and Mars, the target of SpaceX's quest, is a world that has one-third the gravity of the Earth. Venus is about the size of the Earth, but it's not a hospitable place at all. Next, we zoom out to compare Earth to the Jovian planets. Uranus and Neptune are each about four times Earth's size, with Jupiter being about ten times the Earth's diameter. Saturn's rings are almost as big as the Earth-Moon orbit. Now we get even larger size scales, and we see the red dwarf star, Wolf 359, which is a close stellar neighbor of the Sun, and only about twice the diameter of Jupiter. The Sun itself, red and mottled in the middle, is ten times bigger than Jupiter's diameter. The brightest star in the sky, Sirius, is about twice the Sun's diameter. Then we venture into even larger red giant stars. Pollux of the Gemini Twins is five or so times bigger than Sirius. Arcturus in Booties the Hunter is three times that, with the Eye of Taurus Aldebaran twice that size. Zooming out even further, Rigel, another bright star of Orion, is about Aldebaran's size, but is a blue giant star. 
But Antares, the heart of the scorpion, is enormous, over a dozen times the size of Rigel. Betelgeuse tops them all at 770 times the diameter of the Sun, or 77,000 times the diameter of Earth. Betelgeuse also isn't a typical star. We think of the Sun as having a clearly defined photosphere, and we only see the wispy corona during an eclipse. But Betelgeuse is an amorphous, blobby, wibbly-wobbly, burbly cauldron. It's about five astronomical units in radius. Our Sun is so large that a million planet Earths could fit inside it, but Betelgeuse is so large that two billion suns could fit inside it. Its atmosphere can be seen and observed to extend out to about 30 astronomical units, which is the orbit of Neptune. And by the way, this beautiful artwork was done by El Casada at the European Southern Observatory. If you look at different wavelengths of light, you'll see a different extent. For example, the ALMA array, which studies the skies at millimeter wavelengths of light, measures Betelgeuse to be about 1,400 times the diameter of the Sun. This image of Betelgeuse was taken in 2017 and shows it to not be completely spherical in appearance. That's mostly a trick of the brightness variations. But Betelgeuse, like the Sun, is known to have mass ejections and is known to vary in brightness in ways that would be startling if the Sun did likewise. When you think about this size, you naturally wonder about how much stuff makes up the star. Betelgeuse is thought to be somewhere around 20 times the mass of the Sun. Parallactic measurements show it to be about 150 or 160 parsecs away, or about 550 light years. Given its apparent brightness, its known physical size, and its distance, we can calculate its luminosity. It's over 120,000 times more luminous than the Sun. For comparison, the Sun's output is about 4 times 10 to the 26th watts, and all of human civilization produces 20 times 10 to the 12th watts, so all of Earth's power output would be just one fleeting flare of Betelgeuse. Or, if you really wish to think about it, it's about 1.6 times 10 to the 18th human civilization power output. That's what HCPO means here. As for the spectral type, it is listed in the SIMBAD database as an M1 or M2, 1A or 1B. The M is its general Morgan Keenan type, with the 1 or 2 meaning it's on the hottest end of that type. The 1A or 1B means it's a luminous supergiant star. In the simplest terms, the MK type is classified based on the overall appearance of the spectrum. The luminosity class is based on the widths of the spectral lines. Denser stars with a higher surface gravity have pronounced pressure broadening of the spectral lines. The gravity, and therefore the pressure, on the surface of a giant star is much lower than it is on a dwarf star. This is because the giant's radius is so much greater than the dwarf's for the same mass. This means that the widths of the line in the spectrum are interpreted as luminosity effects, allowing a luminosity class to be assigned purely by examining the spectrum. Here we see a spectrum taken by a talented astronomer, Olivier Gard, back in 2019 from his observatory in the Rhone Alps in France. We can clearly see the red end of the spectrum dominates all the emission. The large dips are absorption features due to, among other things, dust surrounding the star. There are also cool molecular transitions embedded throughout. The spectrum is indicative of an early M-type star with a supergiant luminosity class. Just for reference, here we see an HR diagram showing the location of the M-type stars. We also see the band of supergiants, which is on the extreme red end. Let's backtrack a bit. How exactly do we know its size? Theoretically, if we can determine a star's total luminosity and its surface temperature, we can use the Stefan Boltzmann law to get its radius, if we assume a simple spherical surface emitting uniformly. We'll see that this is tricky to apply to Betelgeuse. Typically, it's really hard to get stellar sizes. There are lots of methods. Astronomers can use long base interferometry for single stars. Also, if the moon passes in front of a star, the speed at which it fades out as the moon occults it gives a measure of the star's size. If you have a distance measurement with, say, parallax, and if the star is part of an eclipsing binary pair, then stellar sizes can be obtained from the light curve. But Betelgeuse is near enough and big enough that it can be directly imaged. 
That's what we see here in this VLA image at a wavelength of 7 millimeters. This radio image shows it to be a distinctly non-spherical object. In 2009, Pierre Carvella of the University of Paris used ESO's VLT to capture this image of a complex nebula surrounding Betelgeuse. This infrared image is a combination of images in the wavelength range of about 7 to 20 microns. These are well to the red of the visible light range of 0.4 to 0.7 microns. The black disk corresponds to a very bright part of the image that was masked to allow the fainter nebula to be seen. And this nebula is about 400 astronomical units in size and is composed of silica and alumina dusts. These cold, dusty products are the expected output of stars like Betelgeuse that are near the end of their lives. In the center of that black disk, Curvella and his team used the Very Large Telescope's Adaptive Optics NACO instrument to get an image resolution down to 37 milli arc seconds. This image is half an arc second wide, and the red ring shows the size of Jupiter's orbit at about 5 AU. As you can see, there are plume-like structures around Betelgeuse. In December of 2019, Betelgeuse suddenly dimmed. Pierre Carvella again used ESO's VLT to image it. Again, we see an extended infrared emission due to cool dust extending out many hundreds of astronomical units. The central portion was again occulted by a little disk to get the surrounding expanding shell. That tiny dot in the center is about 5 AU wide, which is the size of Jupiter's orbit around the Sun. And if we zoom in on that dot, we see images of about 11 months apart from 2019. We see Betelgeuse before and after that amazing dimming event. With a more advanced adaptive optics instrument on ESO's Very Large Telescope, we see how much the star faded and how its apparent shape changed. Looking at it more generally, here's a history of the visual magnitude variability of Betelgeuse from 1995 to 2025 using data from the American Association of Variable Star Observers. We see the 2020 New Year's Eve drop in brightness. It's amazing to see the variability by eye that can happen and how observers with backyard telescopes can contribute to meaningful science that is prized by professional astronomers. You should check out aavso.org to see how you can contribute. When this happened, it was all in the news. We see Herb Rabb's side-by-side images of Orion in the sky, which clearly show the difference between Betelgeuse's appearance in 2012 on the left and February of 2020 on the right. He took both images with the same exact photographic setup and exposure length to clearly show the difference. At the time, there was a big kerfuffle wondering if Betelgeuse's dimming meant it was about to explode. Like all red supergiants, Betelgeuse will one day go supernova, but astronomers don't think this is happening now. The shift in shape and brightness was likely due to one of two scenarios, surface cooling due to exceptional stellar activity or dust ejection towards our point of view. No matter what, red giants are turbulent stars. This surface brightness hydrodynamical numerical simulation was made by B. Freytag at the Uppsala University in Sweden. It shows the large-scale movement of gas, just like the granules and supergranules in the Sun. However, the size of these variations is on the order of astronomical units rather than thousands of miles, and the time frame for this video is on the order of years. If you were to fly in a spaceship and go near Betelgeuse, you would find that you'd be flying into a cloud-like structure that got brighter and brighter and brighter towards the center. You'd fly by globs of mass that are moving out with enormous winds that would buffet your spacecraft. As you tried to get closer and closer, you'd eventually find yourself in an incredibly bright, foggy mist, and you'd get closer to the star. You would likely never see a proper photosphere. Many of the absorption features that are found in Betelgeuse spectrum come from the expanding shell of gas and dust that it's shedding. This expanding nebula is similar to what I chatted about last time for the low-mass stars, how we had a star like the Sun puff itself apart to form a planetary nebula. But Betelgeuse isn't waiting. It's not even done with its life, and it's already puffing itself apart. There are a few well-known red supergiants like Betelgeuse around the sky. A few examples are Antares, Epsilon Pegasi, Zeta Cephei, Lambda Valorum, and Eta Persei. 
And some red supergiants are larger and even more luminous, with radii exceeding over a thousand times that of the Sun. These are the so-called red hypergiants. Some examples include Vy Canis Majoris, Mu Cephei, Vv Cephei, S Persei, Uy Scuti, and Westerland 1 W26. This pie chart shows the rough stellar mass distribution for all known stars. Nearly all stars in existence have one solar mass or less. The universe likes to make small stars. Fully 88% of all the stars in existence are these small ones. Then, about 11% have masses between one solar mass and four solar masses. These stars will have similar evolutionary fates to the Sun. And I've dodged the question for a while for now. Will Betelgeuse go supernova tomorrow? Nobody knows. What is certain is that it's on its last legs. It could explode tomorrow, or in a year, or in 10,000 years, or a million years. We just don't know. But is there a chance it'll explode soon? Of course. We just don't know enough about Betelgeuse to make any kind of prediction whatsoever. And it's one of these massive stars that remains in this pie chart. It's one of the tiny fraction of stars that is less than 1% of all the stars in existence that are more massive than about eight solar masses. Let's look at the process by which all of these stars go away.